Well, class, here we are at the last lesson of Unit 5. And after this unit concludes, uh, you're really going to see the drama start to pick up between the northern states and the southern states. Unit 6 will be about getting to the breaking point uh, of the Civil War, and then Unit 7 will be about the Civil War itself. So we're almost to, if you will, the most exciting part to many people of American History 1. So the subject of this uh, lecture, it's going to seem in some ways like two mini lectures that are lumped together, but they are related by the common theme of slavery. So the first part of this lecture will be about the rise of abolitionism. The second part of this lecture will be about the Texas War of Independence. Now, how are they related? Well, whenever Texas becomes an independent country, it gets its independence from Mexico, and I'll talk about that later it's going to want to enter the United States as a slave territory and eventually a slave state. And that is going to uh, bring a lot of tension uh, between the North and the South because basically this is the first major piece of land that the United States is considering gaining uh, since the Missouri Compromise, or one of the only pieces of land. So basically, uh, when Texas, uh, whenever the United States considers annexing Texas, which did have slavery, it is going to not play well with the abolitionist movement, which at the time of the annexation of Texas, is uh, the abolitionist movement is growing. So the two uh, themes, abolitionism and the annexation and, of Texas, uh, those go hand in hand because they both relate to the controversy over slavery in the western part of what is now the United States. First, though, I will talk about the rise of abolitionism. And one thing to keep in mind is that abolitionism for a long time is a kind of small vocal minority movement. Uh, not a lot of people get into the abolitionist movement until things like the Second Great Awakening and things like uh, the possibility of annexing Texas uh, coming up. Okay, so let's talk about abolitionism first. So early on in the history of the United States, as you know, uh, right after the American Revolution, slavery is going to be abolished in all of the northern states north of Maryland and Delaware, it's going to, which is considered basically where the Mason-Dixon line is, if you've heard of that. It's the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, so slavery had either been abolished completely uh, immediately after the American Revolution, or it had been abolished over time after the American Revolution, but by say the 1820s, 1830s, there is no more slavery in the northern states. And of course it was banned in the Northwest Territory according to the Northwest Ordinance. At the very beginning of our country's history, even many Southerners were willing to admit that slavery was not the best of options uh, to base an economy on. They were willing to admit that it was not the best of institutions, and they would even describe it as a necessary evil. They would be willing to admit that it was not a good thing, but that they needed it for their economy. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, I believe it was, called it like holding a wolf by the ears. You don't want to find yourself holding a wolf by the ears, but once you do, you don't want to let it go because you'll have negative consequences afterwards. Well, uh, to a lot of Southerners, uh, having slavery was like holding a wolf by the ears. It was a necessary evil. You will see over time, however, the South much less willing to admit the evils of slavery, and eventually they'll start defending it as a good thing. Now remember that abolitionism we talked about a little bit in the last lecture. It is going to be the most significant reform movement of the antebellum period, and to be frank, probably the most significant reform movement of uh, the entire history of the United States. Okay, so Regarding the ending of slavery, there were some other ideas that popped up before abolitionism became more popular. There was, for example, this idea that maybe slavery needed to end, but needed to end gradually so that the southern economy could adjust to losing its free labor. So if you end it gradually, the south can find other means of production. Uh, they could maybe industrialize. They could find ways to make cotton profitable without slavery. Or there was this idea of gradually getting rid of slavery and then financially compensating the owners for uh, the loss of their so-called slave property. That was one idea early on. Another idea early on uh, would be the idea of sending anyone that was black back to Africa where their ancestors had come from. Uh, 
and that was known as the colonization movement. There was a group called the American Colonization Society that formed, and uh, this satisfied uh, a lot of white supremacists. There were a lot of people that were against slavery, but were also white supremacists. So they were they wanted to free slaves, but they didn't want to have to compete with for jobs with, with black people or have to live with black people. So a lot of these whites said, "Okay, let's end slavery," and then also move all of the uh, blacks, the ex-slaves, back to Africa, where their ancestors were from, and uh, make the United States quote-unquote white man's country. This is going to be uh, a movement that does not work out very well. They actually tried it out, and to be honest, even if the federal government had put all of its efforts towards moving slaves or ex-slaves back to Africa, uh, by the time of the Civil War, slaves were being reproduced naturally. The slave population was increasing naturally faster than people could be uh, immigrated back to Africa. So this idea does not work. Even if, you, if they wanted it to work, it logistically just wouldn't work out. So early ideas in slavery uh, didn't really work. Now, keep in mind that during the antebellum period, you will have what's known as the Second Great Awakening. And after the Second Great Awakening happens, a lot of Northerners are not going to see slavery as just this bad thing, not just this, this necessary evil that the South claims. They're going to start seeing it as a sin against God. They're going to see it as not just your average bad thing, but as an evil thing that must be eradicated. And so that will lead to the abolitionist movement. Uh, think of it this way. Uh, whenever it comes to the issue of rape or the issue of murder, you don't see people going around saying that rape and murder need to be gradually phased out. You see people saying that murder and rape should be stopped as much as possible, and that's basically what the abolitionists are going to say. They are going to say that, that slavery is one of the most evil things that exist on this earth. It's almost on par, if not on par, with things like rape and murder, and there's no excuse for getting rid of it gradually. There's no excuse for it existing at all. It should be gotten rid of immediately. So in the, in the context of American history, abolition is referring to the immediate ending of slavery. And as far as compensating the owners for their financial losses, they should get no compensation because what they were doing was evil to begin with. So in the end, the abolitionist movement will become the most, uh, if you will, extreme of the anti-slavery movements. There will be lots of anti-slavery movements. For example, there will be a lot of people that say, don't let slavery go out west, but let it stay where it is. And I'll talk more about that idea later on. But the most extreme of the anti-slavery uh, groups will be the abolitionist groups. And I'll talk about some of the major abolitionists here in a moment. But remember... Abolitionism, or the abolitionist movement, refers to the complete and immediate emancipation of slaves. Emancipation it being a fancier word for freeing. So let's talk about four of the major abolitionists, the individual abolitionists, uh, that come about during this time period, especially after the Second Great Awakening. And uh, you have a chart in front of you. And in the middle oval, I'll say it twice, you put the words major abolitionist. Again, in the middle oval, put major abolitionist. We'll talk about uh, four of them. Uh, the first one that I'll talk about is not the one pictured here on the left. I'll talk about her in a moment. Uh, the first one will be David Walker. Now, David Walker had never been his slave himself. He was a black northerner, uh, but he was heavily against uh, slavery, and he even promoted the idea of violence, if necessary, to end slavery. Uh, he writes a, a book or an essay called An Appeal to the Colored People of the World, and he basically calls for ending slavery and using violence if necessary. Now, I've already told you about the idea of civil disobedience and how that if you want to get changes made in society, violence is not usually the, the best answer. So David Walker uh, is not going to be one of the widest appealing of abolitionists, but he is going to be one of them. Uh, the next abolitionist will be a woman who had lived under slavery, and her name was Sojourner Truth. And she kind of had the double whammy in, in society, uh, two things that made her considered to be almost like a second-class citizen. Not only was she black, which made her in 
a dominantly white society, considered almost like second class, but she was also a woman. So she knew what it was like to be oppressed because of her race and because of her sex, and she was known uh, for being incredibly eloquent, a very good speech maker. She made one speech uh, promoting women's rights, especially, I believe, called Ain't I a Woman, which might be a, something that you read in English classes. But she will be a promoter of both the abolition of slavery and of women's rights. Now, the next two abolitionists are the ones that are the most important to remember. They are the most prominent of the abolitionists and, honestly, uh, among the most vocal. Uh, David Walker and Sojourner Truth were vocal as well, but the next two will be the ones that get the most attention from historians. So the next one will be William Lloyd Garrison. The thing to note about William Lloyd Garrison is that it's pretty obvious that he's white, and, and that's important to note. It was not just ex-slaves. It was not just uh, free blacks that were in favor of abolitionism. There, uh, a major segment of the white population also promoted uh, abolition of slavery. And so he is going to start a newspaper known as the Liberator. He's going to be known for being very aggressive uh, in attacking slavery. He is going to, for example, uh, call for violence to end slavery, just like David Walker had. And... He was, uh, he was very uh, attention-getting. Uh, he wanted to get in people's faces about uh, the issue of slavery. Again, he publishes a newspaper called The Liberator, uh, promoting, again, the abolition of slavery, using violence if necessary, reporting about how bad slavery could get, what the slavery conditions were actually like for some slaves. Uh, at one point, he is going to be so publicly aggressive that he is going to go into the streets of the city he lived in. I believe he lived in Boston. And he's going to take a copy of the Constitution out in front of a crowd. And remember, the Constitution has the three-fifths compromise in it. So in a sense, the, the Constitution allows for slavery. And he is going to say the Constitution of the United States is a document that endorses slavery. And he takes this copy of the Constitution and burns it in front of everybody. I'm not sure that William Lloyd Garrison ever actually got beaten up. Uh, he definitely got some threats for his actions. He was definitely very vocal in your face and uh, angered a lot of people. There is a slight error on this slide. You'll see it says number two for William Lloyd Garrison. It really should say number three. Now on to number four, the most famous of the abolitionists. And he will not have the same attitude or strategy as William Lloyd Garrison. And he will prove to be the most popular and most respected of the uh, abolitionists. And that will be the famous Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass was a, born a slave. And he eventually, he was, uh, I believe he was a slave in Maryland. And he eventually escapes to northern states, and he's going to write an autobiography. Uh, some of you may have read excerpts of his autobiography, A Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, and he's going to talk about how brutal his experience as a slave was, and it was a very brutal experience, a very physically brutal experience, a very emotionally brutal experience. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that slaves were not allowed to learn how to read and write, and whenever he was enslaved, I believe it was the wife of his slave owner taught him a little bit of basic reading, maybe some letters, but for the most part, he taught himself how to read and write, which is incredible to think about. When you think about, imagine getting a first grade level of reading and writing education, and then from there being able to write some of the most beautifully written uh, prose in American history. This man was a genius, largely self-taught, and he's going to use his, his intellectual gifts to talk about uh, his life as a slave. In fact, uh, he was so good at writing uh, that a lot of people that had racist tendencies said, surely a black man could not have written this. This must have been written by a white man. Uh, but in the end, people believe that he was the writer of this. He was, was a runaway slave as well, he, and so... Technically, he could be returned if caught to his owners. Uh, the, the South was known for sending bounty hunters into the North to catch uh, runaway slaves. Now, what ends up happening is becomes so popular because of his writing that people in England 
are so moved that they donate enough money to buy his freedom from his slave master. Now, one thing worth noting about him is that he was not one that promoted violence. Uh, he promoted civil disobedience, he promoted nonviolent protest, and he believed that if you wanted to make changes in society, you needed to do so through nonviolence and through political means. In other words, if you don't like how things are being done in this country, change the laws. And so he'll be very involved in politics. Uh, he will join whatever political party is gaining momentum and is attacking slavery. Uh, so again, he believes in nonviolence. He believes in, in using government action to fix problems, to create reforms. And in the end, that's the strategy that works. Remember, it's the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, a law that bans slavery in the United States. Something else worth noting that I mentioned in the last lecture is that he is a supporter of women's rights as well. Uh, he is going to say that women are another oppressed minority group within the United States, and he had actually physically attended the Seneca Falls Convention when the first official women's rights movement began in 1848. Uh, so he was a major public figure, a major defender of minority groups and, and ensuring the the natural rights of all American citizens, of all the American people. And again, what was his tactic? It was not violence, it was nonviolence, and it was through political action. Getting basically abolitionists, or at least anti-slavery people, elected into office that could pass laws to attack slavery. So there are your four major abolitionists. Again, Garrison and Douglas are the two most major ones to note. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about resistance from slaves. Now, we've talked a little bit before about how slaves resisted. I'm going to elaborate on that more now. So one form of slave resistance would be to do things like sabotage equipment. You might break the cotton gin on purpose so that work could not be done as much that day. You might break some of the tools that the, the master gives you. You might engage in a work slowdown, work as slowly as you can without the master knowing. And that actually could be pulled off more easily than you would think because remember that the masters felt like the slaves were intellectually inferior. They thought that slaves were dumb. And so uh, slaves could play on that stereotype and act like they were too dumb to do the job well or do, to do the job quickly and that way get away with doing a work slowdown. Now let me elaborate on the most uh, famous form of, of uh, slave resistance or resistance to slavery, and that would be the Underground Railroad. So the Underground Railroad will develop. It was never an official organization. It was secret. It was informal. There was no president of the Underground Railroad, but it kind of developed on its own, and it was a system that helped thousands of slaves escape from the South. And what would happen is basically uh, people would run away. There were oftentimes people that had successfully run away before that were known as conductors of the Underground Railroad that might meet with these new runaways and help guide them to safety. Leaving the South and escaping to the North or to any other anti-slavery area was not easy. Imagine embarking on a journey to, leave, to go somewhere hundreds of miles of way, uh, away and you don't know how to get there and you're doing it all on foot. So the Underground Railroad is going to, to rely on, if you will, conductors, people that could serve as guides to help uh, slaves escape to freedom. And the most famous, ones, most famous one of these is going to be Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman is pictured at the top. Harriet Tubman helped over 70 slaves escape and then taught many of them how to help additional slaves escape. So she directly saved over 70 slaves and she indirectly saved over 100. And she, when every time she escaped with slaves to the north, what would she do? She'd turn around and go right back into the south, which is an incredibly courageous thing for her to do because any time that she went back into the south, she risked getting caught and uh, there was a bounty on her head. Uh, and let me go ahead and talk about what it would be like to be escaping on the Underground Railroad. What you're going to do is you're going to try to find a conductor like Harriet Tubman, who, by the way, never lost a single person. Every single person she helped got to freedom. 
so what you do is you usually would hook up with one of these conductors and, and go with them uh, to the north. You would uh, usually travel at night because it's easier to be uh, sneaky during that time. Uh, you would be chased by bounty hunters. You would be chased uh, by bloodhounds. They would be tracking you. So you needed conductors like Harriet Tubman to help you know the safe way to go and the unsafe way to go. Uh, you need to know if you had to cross a river, which part of the river was safe and which part wasn't. When you were crossing these rivers, you were oftentimes not to use a paddle because a paddle makes noise in the water. So instead, you'd push yourself along with a pole. Uh, you would try to take the routes that were not the main road. You'd try to take secondary roads because you'd be less likely to get caught. Uh, now, what happens when you need to sleep? Uh, what oftentimes would happen is you would go and you'd find a, a safe house, if you will, a, a house that was considered uh, maybe, if you will, a railroad station. Uh, and by the way, the Underground Railroad was not actually a railroad. It was not actually under the ground. It's called the Underground Railroad because it was a secretive route that got people to the north. So, okay, let's go back to these safe houses. You find these safe houses, and these safe houses, oftentimes you'd have a secret knock that you'd have to do to get into the door. And then once you got in, you might be hidden uh, in a secret room or in a closet or in an attic or in a basement. And it's very likely that a bounty hunter led by these bloodhounds might come knocking at that door. But because the people that owned these houses were in favor of freeing slaves, they would basically lie to the bounty hunters and say that there were no slaves in that house. And then the bounty hunters would move on. Once the coast was clear, you would be led, oftentimes again by conductors or given directions by the people in these houses, to the next safe house. So you go from safe house to safe house to safe house until you got to a free territory. And I told you that my uh, mom's side of the family was from the Burned Over District in western New York. And uh, whenever I went there last to visit, there was probably a dozen houses that I saw uh, that were designated as safe houses and, and we're still are still remembered with historical markers today as being places where slaves would hide out in their escape to the north. So this was a, an elaborate system. You can see a map of it here and you can see how people had a long way to go so they had to have guides and they had to have safe places to hide along the way. Now at first just getting to northern states would have been good enough like you see right here. Eventually, there will be a law passed called the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, and even the northern states will no longer be a safe place to hide. I'll talk more about that later, but just note that right now, southern slave owners are getting increasingly angry about the fact that basically their so-called slave property is being quote-unquote stolen from them, it's running away from them, and eventually they're going to call on the federal government to pass a law to try to put a stop to the working of the Underground Railroad. And that'll be the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. I'll talk more about that later. But to be honest, even though this Fugitive Slave Act that is meant to help uh, claim runaways, even though it's passed, you're still going to see thousands of slaves escape to the north before the Civil War. Of course, after the Civil War ends, slavery is over and the Underground Railroad will go away. Now, the... Uh, the other example that I'll give you of slave resistance will be violence. So sometimes slaves would resort to violence. There would be rebellions. And I talked about this a little bit in an earlier lecture, uh, and now I'm going to elaborate more on a specific one known as Nat Turner's Rebellion, or simply Turner's Rebellion. So in this time period, the uh, Slave owners wanted to promote their own twisted version of Christianity that said that uh, slavery was a good thing. And what better way would there be to convince slaves that God wanted them to be slaves than to have slave preachers go around promoting this twisted version of Christianity? And that's what Nat Turner was. Nat Turner was a slave preacher. He was a slave minister. He was given more freedom than the average slave because he was going around and preaching uh, a pro-slavery form of Christianity, or so the slave owners thought. What Nat Turner ultimately is actually doing is organizing a major slave rebellion in Virginia. So he goes around, he, he starts claiming to have visions from God that he's supposed to help overthrow slave owners, and 
Uh, in the end, he does organize a rebellion, an incredibly violent rebellion. He doesn't just go after white men. He also goes after white women. He even goes after white children, and I'm not exaggerating, even kills babies, white babies. Why does he do this? How does he justify this? Well, he says even these children can grow up to be slave owners. So this will be an incredibly nasty rebellion. This picture at the bottom does not do justice to how vicious this rebellion was. But the rebellion does happen. Eventually it is going to be stopped by uh, the uh, white militias. The state militia of, of Virginia will stop this, and Nat Turner will be executed for this crime uh, against Virginia, at least according as a crime according to Virginia. You can understand why he organized such a rebellion, though. So what's the consequence of slave rebellions? Here's the bad thing. The slave rebellions don't end up being successful in the southern states. Now, there have been successful slave rebellions in world history. For example, in Haiti, there was a Haitian revolution. Uh, and so the South was very aware of the risk of rebellions. And in many areas of the South, slaves actually outnumbered whites, sometimes two to one, sometimes even three to one. So if one of these slave rebellions got out of hand, and that Turner's rebellion could well have gotten out of hand, but if one of them actually did and gained more momentum and, and got hundreds of people, for, and hundreds of slaves participating, you could see an all out rebellion of slavery uh, in the southern states. So what ends up happening is that the southern white slaveholding class, and even southern whites that didn't hold uh, slaves but promoted slavery, you're going to see the passage of stricter and stricter slave codes. And that's very interesting because the southerners, as the antebellum period goes on, are going to keep saying things like, oh, slaves like their conditions. They like being taken care of by white masters. They don't have to worry about food and clothing because it's taken care of for them. But if that was really the case, then why are rebellions happening? If that is really the case, why are they having to pass stricter and stricter rules? If that is the case, why is the South becoming increasingly afraid of the abolitionist movement? In fact, uh, if you want to ha have some dates, you don't have to know these dates, uh, but this will uh, kind of help you understand this. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison's first issue of The Liberator, the anti-slavery uh, abolitionist uh, newspaper that promoted violence. It first came out on January the 1st of 1831. In August of 1831, Nat Turner's rebellion took place, and some people thought that there was a connection between the two. They thought that Turner's rebellion might have been inspired by uh, Garrison's writing. I don't know that that's true, but that was a fear. And in fact, it was uh, you weren't allowed to have abolitionist writings in the South. It had to be snuck into the South, openly carrying around any uh, book or newspaper or magazine that was against slavery in the South ends up becoming, I believe, illegal. So keep in mind that the abolitionist movement will be small at the beginning. Uh, it will grow over time, though. And remember also that the southern states are becoming increasingly afraid of slave rebellions. And they're also increasingly afraid that people in the North are going to start causing slave rebellions. They're going to start promoting them. They might start participating in them. And in the next unit, you'll learn about a potential slave rebellion that would have been very nasty had uh, the abolitionist John Brown been successful. And that will, uh, again, be covered in the next uh, unit. The next unit is going to be very interesting. Lots of drama in the next unit. Okay, so... Overall, what is going to be the reaction to abolitionism? Well, let me say that even in the North, uh, abolitionism is not going to be popular with a lot of Northerners. And, and you might want to ask yourself, why not? I mean, the Northern states don't allow for slavery. Uh, and I'll explain in a moment. Remember that a lot of people in the Northern states were against slavery, but they were also white supremacists. Now, William Lloyd Garrison was not one of those. But there were lots of people that were against slavery, but not to the point that they wanted to get rid of it completely. Think of it this way. Um, most Americans don't believe in child labor or, or abusing uh, workers that make clothing. But if you look at the clothing that we, we wear in this country, it's being made in countries where the workers are being abused and sometimes they're children in sweatshops. 
So a lot of times, uh, I've been asked by students multiple times, why was the North okay with this? Well, it's because they didn't see slavery in their face every day in, in the same way that we don't see some of the terrible labor conditions uh, that lead to the products that we buy from countries overseas. So it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Okay, some more specific reasons. One reason is that if you're a northern textile mill owner or if you're a textile mill worker, then your money is tied to this cheap cotton coming out of the south. And so textile mill owners wanted this cheap cotton. Uh, the, the workers in these factories, even though they weren't being treated very well, they knew that if slavery went away, then southern cotton would go, might go away, and then their job might go away. So if you were tied to the textile industry in the north, you wanted that southern cotton. Another reason is a racist reason. A lot of, uh, or a semi-racist, semi-economic reason, a lot of uh, Northerners fear that if slavery ended, then the slavery, uh, ex-slaves would move north, and they didn't exactly like the idea of having that many of their neighbors being black, and they also did not like the idea of having to compete with these ex-slaves for factory jobs. An ex-slave that's used to being paid absolutely nothing may well be willing to work for less than a northern white factory uh, worker and if a union tries to go on strike then maybe these ex-slaves could be used to replace them so there was a fear that they would steal jobs uh, very similar to the fear that a lot of Americans had of Irish immigrants stealing jobs and finally uh, another reason, and this one is actually pretty obvious, a lot of the uh, northern citizens were against abolitionism uh, because they said if we actually promote abolition of slavery, the South is going to try to secede from the Union and we might have a civil war. So they might have said, yeah, slavery is bad, but it's not worth fighting and dying over. It's not worth having a civil war over. And so they were willing to put up with it. So most Northerners, when the abolitionist movement begins, are actually against uh, the abolitionist movement because they knew part of their economy was tied to it. They didn't want ex-slaves stealing their jobs. And they, even if they were against slavery, they feared that abolitionism could start a civil war. And honestly, it kind of did. If you look at southern states, whenever they seceded from the Union after Lincoln's election, many of them directly say that it's because of the abolitionists in the North and the fact that they've hijacked the federal government to be anti-slavery, that's why we're leaving. So it's going to be a mixed reaction in the North, especially at the beginning. Now, over time, more and more Northerners are going to hitch themselves to the abolitionist cause, especially as slavery threatens to expand westward. Uh, more on that later on. But at, at this point, the Northern reaction is going to be mixed. Now, in the South, the Southern reaction is going to be uh, extremely negative. Southerners are going to hate the abolitionists. They're going to ban abolitionist literature from being uh, published or read in the southern states. And they're going to even start to say that slavery is not a necessary evil. They're, they're going to go away from this necessary evil argument, and they're going to basically say we need slavery. We can't have our economy without it. We have to have free labor to, to uh, pick our cotton. If we don't have that, then our economy is going to fall apart. And, in fact, they're going to drop the phrase necessary evil, and they're going to start calling it, quote, a peculiar institution, which is just a way of saying, hey, it's this weird thing that we do. Peculiar institution. Weird thing we do, just deal with it. Uh, and then eventually, they're going to start calling it even a positive good. And there is actually going to be some uh, writing, there are going to be some writings put out there that defend slavery. For example, if you look at this picture here on the right-hand side, you have this image of the slave owners looking on while the happy slaves are dancing to music and are smiling and the children are petting pets. And uh, the Southerners are going to say, this is what slavery really looks like. We're taking care of these inferior people. Sure, we get their work and their labor, but we give them, uh, they don't have to worry about food, they don't have to worry about clothing, they don't have to worry about shelter because we take care of them, almost like they're our children. Now, obviously, slavery was not this pleasant, uh, but the South is going to promote this this lie that slavery is a, a positive good. And uh, I mean, it gets ridiculous. There are there are even doctors that start to say uh, things like uh, that blacks are more prone to going insane, so they need the structure of slavery to keep them from going insane and being uncivilized. There's going to be this notion that uh, that 
the slaves were saved from being savages in Africa by being put into the southern slavery system. You'll even have doctors start inventing a disease. And I don't remember what they called it, but it might as well have been called runaway-itis. They basically say that there is a disease that is more common in uh, black people that's, that makes them want to run away. Which is obviously idiotic because our country is founded on this idea of freedom, and if you're enslaved, of course you're going to want to run away from, from uh, slavery. But that's how ridiculous some of these articles get. And uh, one of the more sinister ways, and then I'll move on, that uh, the South defends slavery, and I've said this before, is that they'll start uh, to cherry-pick certain verses out of the Bible and say that God and Jesus and Christianity in general is in support of this slavery system which we all know today was an evil system. Back then, there were a lot of efforts to defend it among Southerners. Okay, so overall, at the beginning of the abolitionist movement, the reaction to uh, abolitionism is going to be either indifferent or you're going to see people be against abolitionism at first. So again, in the South, the, the Southern states hate abolition, abolitionism. In the North, it's a mixed reaction but most people uh, are either not really caring about it, or if they care about it, they don't think it's worth fighting a war over. But you do have a vocal group of abolitionists, people like David Walker, people like Sojourner Truth, people like William Lloyd Garrison, and people most famously like Frederick Douglass. They're going to keep this issue going, and they're going to keep talking about it, and eventually their movement is going to gain some momentum, especially when the United States gains land further west, west of the Louisiana Territory. So eventually the United States is going to get this area known as the Oregon country. But more significantly related to the slavery issue, eventually the United States is going to get Texas. Then a little after getting Texas, they're going to go to war with Mexico and get all of this land. And then the big question is going to be, what's going to happen to the states that come from this land. And so basically, the Missouri Compromise does not apply to this, and there's going to end up being another compromise, again engineered by Henry Clay to deal with it. But basically, uh, the issue of slavery in the West is going to come back up again. Henry Clay had tried to keep this issue put to sleep with the, uh, the Missouri Compromise, but once Texas gets its independence from Mexico and, and joins the United States, and then shortly afterwards the United States goes and gets a lot more land from Mexico, the issue over slavery in the West is going to come up again. And at that point, a lot of Northerners are going to get off of the fence, and they're not going to be indifferent about abolitionism. A lot of them are going to be against slavery or at least, at the very least, against slavery expanding to the West. More on that in Unit 6. All right, so let's finish up Unit 5 with the Texas War of Independence and how it relates to slavery. And in the next unit, I'll talk about uh, the Mexican-American War and how that kind of really gets the ball rolling towards the Civil War. I've intentionally put the Texas War of Independence in Unit 5 and the Mexican-American War in Unit 6 because a lot of people tend to get the two confused. So I figure if I put them in two different units, people will not get them confused. <clears throat> so again, if you look at this map here, uh, on the these two maps on the left-hand side, they show how uh, cotton production increases over time, especially along the Mississippi River. And if you look at the right-hand side, you can see the percentage of slaves over time from 1820 to 1860. And let's look at what slavery is looking like at the time of the Civil War. Right before the Civil War starts, if you look at these, uh, these darker areas uh, on the map, you can see that according to the key in those areas, over half the population is enslaved which is crazy to think about when we talk about a nation being founded on natural rights and on freedom and on being able to govern yourself. In the South, many areas were over half enslaved. A major piece of hypocrisy. Okay, now on to Texas. So Texas uh, used to be part of Mexico. If you look at the map on the right-hand side, you can see Mexico as it existed. Uh, Mexico is going to get its independence from Spain in, I believe, is around 1820, and 
uh, and the northern three, I think they're called provinces, not states, but basically the northern three parts of, of uh, Mexico are going to be California, New Mexico, and Tejas, as it would have been called at the time. And this part of Mexico was largely dry and desert. I've been out there multiple times. Unless you're in eastern Texas or if you're in the, the Rocky Mountains or on the far west coast, almost everything here is dry and desert. So there's not a lot of people moving to this part of Mexico. So what does Mexico do? Mexico starts allowing for Americans to move into Tejas in particular, or Texas, right here to help boost the population of northern Mexico. Now most of Mexico, uh, or most of the Mexican population is further south where Mexico City is. But Mexico wanted to increase its population. You increase the population, you grow as a country, you have more people contributing to the economy, you have more tax revenue you can bring in. And so the United, or excuse me, Mexico is going to have a very lenient policy of immigration uh, regarding Americans. They're going to say, Americans, if you want to come into Texas or Tejas, sure thing. Just adopt Mexican culture, convert to Roman Catholicism. Uh, Mexico is a Catholic nation. Pay taxes to Mexico, uh, and, and basically become a Mexican citizen. And given the, uh, this is very interesting to talk about, given the immigration topics of 2019 uh, and, and the history of the uh, of immigration uh, that goes on between uh, Mexico and the United States. So what ends up happening is basically a lot of Americans start moving into Texas. Eventually, there are more American immigrants in Texas than there are Mexicans in Texas, or Tejas. And this is going to create tension. Basically, what I'm circling here on the map is going to become more American in its population than it is Mexican. So you have lots of these new Texan Americans, people that have moved from places like Louisiana, now living in Tejas. So why does tension go up? Well, number one uh, is that these new, these new people to Texas, because they're from the United States, actually feel more loyalty to the United States than they do to the Mexican government. Sure, they're living on Mexican land, they're living in the Mexican uh, province of Tejas, but they feel more allegiance to the United States. On top of that, a lot of these people from Texas, and I'll be wrong real quickly, a lot of the people that, that moved to Texas or Tejas are coming from the southern part of the United States. And when they move, what are they going to bring with them? Their property. And what is going to be among their property? Slaves. And so a lot of these people that move into Texas or Tejas are going to want to bring their slaves with them and there's going to be a serious problem in, I believe it was 1831, uh, when Mexico decides to make slavery illegal. So they abolished slavery in the early 1830s. And you have all these American immigrants to Texas that own slaves, and they're not willing to give these slaves up. They're very unhappy about this new law, and they're going to refuse to obey it. They're going to refuse to adopt Mexican culture. They're going to refuse to basically uh, become Mexican citizens. They're going to cling to their... United States roots and they're going to cling to their slaves and then on top of that there will be elected later on a new president of Mexico Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana uh, or you could just refer to him as Santa Ana and he's going to declare himself a dictator and we know how Americans feel about dictators we know how they feel about kings and they're not going to like the fact that Santa Ana has declared himself a dictator which is interesting because these and, and hypocritical uh, because a lot of these Texas slave owners are basically dictators over their slaves but they'll overlook that hypocrisy so as long as the slaves are making the money so again the American immigrants to Texas feel more loyalty to the United States than they do to Mexico the uh, Mexican government outlaws slavery, which a lot of Texans did not like because they owned slaves. These are the ones that were from the United States, and they really did not like the new president of Mexico becoming a dictator. So what ends up happening is you have one man named Stephen Austin. He's going to organize an army to prepare for declaring Texas independence from Mexico. 
Now the next question is who's going to lead this army, and that's going to be the man shown here on, on the right. Uh, and that man will be a man named Sam Houston. He had uh, been governor, I believe, of Tennessee. A lot of people have seen him as being the next Andrew Jackson. He had had some personal problems that had that had really uh, hurt him. Uh, and so he kind of gone out west for a new start. And this is when he kind of makes his personal comeback. He's going to become the new leader of the Texas Army. If you look at the name Austin and Houston, those, those names should be familiar. Austin is currently the capital of Texas, and Houston is its biggest city. So once the army is organized and there's someone in command of this army, Sam Houston, Texas will declare independence in 1836. And it's not going to take them long to get this independence. Now, if you look at the map, you can see that there are two major events being uh, pointed to uh, on the map. Uh, and I'm going to talk about those two major events. Basically, I only talk about two battles. There's not a lot to talk about in terms of battles when it comes to the Texas War of Independence. But one of them is a very famous one. And the, uh, the other one is going to be uh, the one that wins the War of Independence. Now, let me go ahead and note that this does occur during Andrew Jackson's presidency. And very surprisingly, Andrew Jackson does not want the United States to get involved. And so officially, the United States stays out of this war. They stay neutral. Given Jackson's personality, that's pretty surprising. But Andrew Jackson says, I'd rather try to buy Texas. And I think he said, let's see if Texas can get their independence first on their own. That way the United States doesn't have to get its hands dirty. So the official position of the United States is to stay out of this war and maybe hope to buy Texas later on. Uh, however, lots of Americans are going to move to Texas to help them fight for their independence. The official U.S. government position is neutral, but a lot of Americans do join in the fight. Okay, so on to the first event, and this is the most famous one. This will be the Battle of the Alamo. So what ends up happening is Santa Ana is going to lead thousands of Mexican troops himself, and dictators oftentimes do lead troops in person. Not, not uh, George Washington. He was not a dictator. That was an exception. But oftentimes uh, dictators are military dictators. So Santa Ana is going to lead some troops, and uh, they are going to corner some of the Texans in this very small building known as the Alamo. And if you look at the numbers, the Mexican army outnumbers those that are in the Alamo almost 10 to 1. So you'd think that the Mexican army could just sweep right in and take out all of the, uh, the Texans that are in the Alamo. Well, there's a problem. If you are in a defensive position, if you are inside the Alamo, they, they basically uh, uh, can play defense and kind of shoot out the windows. And so it's going to be very hard to attack the Alamo because uh, if you go there, someone's going to shoot you from one of the windows in the Alamo and kill you. Uh, and so if you play online uh, shooter games, basically, if you know what the term camping means, this is what the Texans are going to do. They're going to camp. They're going to hide out in this building and shoot at any Mexican that tries to come after them. Uh, there's a problem, though, and this is, unlike video games, eventually you can run out of ammunition. And that's what happens. So what the, the Mexican army does is they basically surround the Alamo uh, they wait until the people inside the Alamo have run out of ammunition, and once that happens, they move in. And they do something that's pretty dirty here. They, uh, Before closing in and literally killing off all of the Texans, uh, uh, one of the trumpet players in the Mexican army is going to play a tune. I don't remember the name of the tune, but it's the name of the tune that bullfighters uh, have played for them right before they kill the bull at the end of a bullfighting session. So if you if you ever heard of bullfighting, there in, in Mexican culture there is a kind of depressing uh, tune that gets played on trumpets uh, or any kind of horn, I guess, and basically it signals that the bull is about to be killed for good. And they played this before they went into the Alamo and killed off every single Texan there. But notice how long they were able to hold them off: 13 days for about two weeks. So the Mexican army is going to go in and kill literally every Texan there, so far as I know. 
So why is this battle mentioned so much in history? Why do people know about the Battle of the Alamo? Well, one, it's because it shows the bravery of the people, the Americans uh, that were in the Alamo. A lot of them had moved to help fight. They knew that once they were surrounded, it was only a matter of time until they would die, but they fought until they could fight no longer. They fought to the last bullet, which shows a lot of bravery. Uh, the other reason that this is mentionable is because this is a classic case of losing a battle but winning the war. Sam Houston was elsewhere, and Sam Houston at this point was building up his army. Uh, and what the Battle of the Alamo does, if nothing else, is it stalls Santa Ana, it distracts Santa Ana, and it basically buys Sam Houston a little bit more time to build up his army. Oh, and by the way, when news of what happens at the Alamo gets out, that's going to make even more people want to join Houston's army. So his army is going to grow as a result of the fact that Santa Ana is spending about two weeks dealing with uh, the Alamo. So losing the battle, but this helps win the war. Which brings me to event number two. Uh, so event number two will be the Battle of San Jacinto. What ends up happening is that the Mexican army gets very confident at this point. They get overconfident at this point, and they're going to go to the banks of the San Jacinto River, and they are going to decide to have a siesta in the early afternoon, meaning they basically take a nap, and Santa Ana will give them permission to do this. Now, what Santa Ana was not aware of was the fact that Sam Houston's men were pretty much on the other side of a hill from the Mexican army, and they were spying. And what ends up happening is that the spies looking over the hill are going to see the Mexican army taking their gun belts off, laying down, taking a nap, and Houston is going to say this is the perfect time to do an ambush. And so the ambush takes place, and that is known as the Battle of San Jacinto. And so this battle takes, I believe, 18 minutes and the Mexican army uh, is going to lose hundreds, I think, of men. I don't remember the numbers. I think that the Ameri or the Texans, which again included a lot of Americans, lose less than uh, 10 people. And this battle only takes 18 minutes, and you have them shouting, remember the Alamo, let's get revenge for the people that died at the Alamo, and very quickly the Mexican army is captured. Uh, Santa Ana tries to change uniforms and steal one of the uniforms of one of the dead soldiers so that he can't be identified, but in the end, he's going to be captured. And I typically ask my students, what are they going to do to Santa Ana? And everyone always says, well, let's kill him, or they should kill him after what he did at the Alamo. But they don't, because he's actually worth more alive to Sam Houston than he's worth dead. So here you see this picture, and I think this is supposed to be Santa Ana here being welcomed by a very relaxed Sam Houston. Why do they keep Santa Ana alive? Because they need his signature. So what ends up happening is Santa Ana is going to be forced under threat of death, they basically force him at gunpoint, to sign a document to officially recognize Texas's independence as a new country. Keep that in mind. Texas is its own country. And in fact, Texas is the only country to ever go on to become a state of the United States. They actually downgraded in a sense. They went from country status to state status. But to be part of the United States, which was growing at this time, was actually a good thing for Texas because it's going to make them stronger. They're going to have uh, a big country uh, to, to depend on. So Santa Ana is going to be allowed to live. He's going to be allowed to return to the capital of Mexico. And the reason for that is that if they had killed Santa Ana as soon as they had gotten his signature, then the Mexican government would have been enraged and they probably would have restarted this war. So they let Santa Ana go. Now, when Santa Ana gets back to Texas, he's going to uh, say that Texas isn't truly independent because he was forced to sign the treaty giving Texas its independence. So that will cause tension later on. Basically, Mexico does not recognize uh, uh, Texas's independence as being truly legitimate. There's another part to this. Now, if you look at the map in your notes, you'll see that there's a shaded area, and that is an area that is disputed between Texas and Mexico after the war. Both Texas and Mexico will claim that to be their territory and that will be a source uh, at the beginning of the Mexican-American War later on. 
So right now, Texas is its own country for about a decade, a, a little bit less. I think it's about nine years. And then after about nine years, the United States will take them in, and that will anger Mexico because they never fully recognizes, never really fully recognized Texas's independence. So again, if you look at this map here, you can see here is Texas for sure. Here is Mexico for sure. And then here's the area that both Texas and Mexico claim. And then you can see the two major battle sites. Okay, so what does this have to do with this slavery debate and the abolitionist movement? Well, eventually Texas, which was a slave-holding country, is going to want to be annexed by the United States, and it's going to want to come in as a slave-holding territory that will eventually become a slave-holding state. Who does not want this to happen? The northern states. They did not want to have uh, more southern slave states. They did not want to start losing power in Congress. They especially did not want to lose power in the Senate to uh, more slave states. So the North doesn't like this because they see this as an expansion of slavery. And by the way, does the Missouri Compromise cover this? No, because Texas was never part of the Louisiana Territory. So tension's going to increase for two reasons. Number one, tension's going to increase over the issue of slavery in the West. And uh, ultimately, this tension will not be solvable. Uh, eventually, it will take a civil war to, to, to solve this issue and ultimately end slavery. But before that happens, think about who else will be unhappy if Texas becomes part of the United States. And that would be the country that had just lost Texas. So whenever the United States later on down the road eventually decides to take Texas in as part of the United States, Mexico is going to be mad. Mexico is especially going to be mad whenever the United States claims that this kind of uh, disputed area here that I'm pointing out, that Mexico is going to be extra mad when, when the United States claims that to be also part of the United States. And eventually there will be a war over this. So the Texas War of Independence will take place in 1836. It takes just a couple months. Uh, and then about 10 years later, you'll see the beginning of another war, this time between the United States and Mexico, partly caused over Texas, and that'll be the Mexican-American War. And once the Mexican-American War takes place, the United States will basically take the northern half of Mexico and the issue of slavery in the West will be reignited and the abolitionists will be enraged by this war and its effects and the Mexican-American War will start us on the road towards uh, the Civil War and that'll be the theme of Unit 6. So right now, uh, remember the Texas War of Independence has just occurred. Texas is its own independent country. Eventually it will become part of the United States in the next unit. And that concludes Unit 5.